Jesus, we thank you that you are a conquering king and that you will indeed bring everything under your authority. It is that already, although we don't see it manifest now. The God of this world, a murderer, a liar, has blinded the world of unbelief from the gospel. That good news that you came as suffering servant and will return as conquering king. And it is only by your blood that we overcome. Lord, thank you for your word, for its promises, for the anchor to our souls that the truth is that you rule history and are bringing all things together under your good and sovereign rule. We look forward to the day when we ourselves will be without sin and will be in your presence glorified. In the meantime, we pray for your help, even this morning as we look to your word, that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us soft hearts, ears to hear all that you would say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation 13. As a Christian, do you ever feel small, surrounded by a world of darkness, puny and powerless against the machinery of godless government, evil entertainment, corrupt corporations, mendacious media? The news lies. Social media spreads deception. Massive corporations are the new oligarchy pulling the strings of the world's governments behind the scenes, ruling the populace without moral anchors and without accountability. Science is pushing the envelope of what it can do technologically without asking what it should do ethically. The technology we we depend on every day cannot be trusted. It is watching what you do and listening to what you think. (laughs) Almost. The truth is, most often get smothered under the immeasurable mountains of information in our world today. And sometimes the truth even gets intentionally deleted by those who want to cancel any witness to the truth. How can we, the puny band of disciples following the Lamb, how can we have any hope in such a hostile, powerful world How can we have hope to penetrate the darkness of our day with the light of truth? As challenging as it may seem to us today, we haven't seen anything yet. A day is coming. In fact, a three and a half year period, 1260 days, still in the future. When the greatest darkness the world has ever known will close its grip on the entire population of the earth. And there have been dark times before ours. Consider the centuries leading up to the Reformation. Men like Wycliffe and John Huss were hunted and murdered for believing and speaking the good news about Christ. The English Protestants in the 1550s suffered under Bloody Mary. The Huguenots in France in the late 1500s were imprisoned and killed and exiled. The country of France, some 500 years later, has still never recovered from that darkness. Christians in China today are in dark times, especially since the communist revolution begun in 1927. But what has happened regionally and in seasons of church history will become the global norm during the great tribulation. That is the period of future world history we are looking at in Revelation 13. That period of human history, the darkest period the world will ever experience, will at the same time be the apex of human potential. It will be the worst period of human behavior. The slogan, be all that you can be, will find its fulfillment in a rebellious humanity, being all that it can be. In something of a new tower of Babel, the world will come together to reach its greatest godless potential. And those looking on will say, oh, the humanity. What will those days mean for the followers of Christ? 
And even here, we can begin to apply the text of Revelation 13 to our own lives as as we look back to times of trouble for Christians and we look forward to times of trouble for followers of the Lamb. And we can apply some timeless truths to our own lives. We will not know what it is like to suffer as the tribulation saints will know. And we have not known what it is like to suffer as perhaps the Huguenots did. We may think sometimes as we read the Bible, either looking back or looking forward, uh, that's pretty cool. Things happened in biblical times, or that's really interesting. There's some things that will happen in future times. But I'm reminded of Romans 15, 4, that what is written is for our benefit. As we read God's word, we, we look back and we learn. And as we read God's word, we look forward and we learn. Let's look forward to the great tribulation as recorded for us in Revelation 13, verses 7 through 10 this morning. Follow along as I read. It was also given to the beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, he is to be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. What we read in this section is total victory. The victory of the Antichrist, the victory of the beast, this is the apex of his power, his crowning achievement. By way of an outline this morning, we will see that the Antichrist will crown his reign of worldwide terror with three triumphs. Look at these three triumphs that crown Antichrist's reign of terror, beginning in verse 7 with total political victory. When the Antichrist has his day, he will exercise total political authority. Look at verse 7. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. We read first in verse 7 that he will make war with the saints. In chapter 11, he did this with the two witnesses. In chapter 12, he makes war against Israel. And in chapter 13, he's depicted as making war with the rest of Israel's children who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. These are believers in Jesus who are not Jews, who come to know the gospel during the tribulation. And then they become hunted by the beast. The Antichrist will be Satan's agent to go to war with the remnants of God's people on the earth. These are the ones who were unable to flee into the wilderness of safety. You remember in Matthew 24, 16, Jesus told those in Jerusalem to flee to the wilderness. And we read in Revelation chapter 12 that God will preserve Jews who believe in the wilderness for a time. In Daniel chapter 7 We read about the Antichrist, these words, verse 21, that horn, speaking of the beast, was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. This is the scene in which the Antichrist is winning. And in Daniel 7, 23, we read that fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. In between those two verses in Daniel 7, the making war with the saints and overpowering them and and crushing all the kingdoms of the earth and devouring it. In between those two verses, there is comfort. Listen to Daniel 7.22. All of this will take place until the ancient of days comes and judgment is passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrives when the saints take possession of the kingdom. So in between two verses in Daniel 7 about total victory of the Antichrist, militarily, politically, we get this comfort that the ancient of days, none other than Jesus Christ himself, will come 
and be his rescuer of the saints. And the saints will inherit the kingdom, the true kingdom, not the imitation kingdom. But we read here in Revelation 13 that it was given to him to make war against the saints and to overcome them. The word overcome is tragically, ironically used in this chapter. Chapter 12, we discovered that the saints are the ones who overcome the dragon. We just sang those words in that last song. In chapter 17, we read that the lamb overcomes the beast and his allies. And you may remember the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. To the one who overcomes is promised eternal life. In fact, the same author, John the Apostle, writes in his letter that the one who overcomes is simply the one who has faith in Jesus. A believer is an overcomer by definition. But here it is said that the beast overcomes the saints. What are we to make of this statement in chapter 13? Does he win? And we have to understand this in its context of a temporary victory. He does indeed overcome them, but he can only overcome them physically. Romans 8, 38 and 39 give us a promise from God that nothing can separate God's people from his love in Christ Jesus, not death and not any created thing. So to be killed by the beast during the great tribulation cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Death can't separate. No created thing can separate. And so these who will lose their lives during the great tribulation for believing in Jesus will be like those who have lost their lives for believing in Jesus throughout history. And we might say with Jim Elliott that he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Even in the worst hour of human history to be overcome by the beast does not remove one from qualifying as an overcomer if you are a believer. Notice in verse 7 that authority is given to the beast. Authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. That is a familiar refrain. That is the refrain we, we think about missions with. Jesus Purchased for himself a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. It is a a grouping of, of individuals from every tongue and tribe and nation and people that will surround the throne of the Lamb and worship in heaven. They get there because they believed the gospel. But here that same phrase, those same four categories are used to describe the scope of Antichrist's political victory. He has authority Across the globe, the same four groups from which Jesus will rescue people are the subjects of his evil reign. That darkness will encompass every strata of humanity on the globe, all under the authority of Antichrist. And this is every arch villain's dream. This is what every evil villain plots for in all the movies to rule the whole world. Nobody has yet succeeded at that villainy. Never yet have we seen this kind of universal and unified darkness in the world where every ethnicity, every language, every culture, every worldview, every philosophy, every class of humanity will be united under one banner against the truth. You see, all of the earth's tribalism will disappear into a Babel tower of unity. One heart, one mind, all aligned under this satanically empowered leader. This is political totalitarianism. Complete military dominance. And as we will see in a few moments, religious uniformity. His total political victory will be stronger and more evil than all despots before. Idi Amin or Pol Pot will have nothing on this beast. Hitler, Stalin, Napoleon, Antiochus Epiphanes, Caligula, Domitian. The beast will embody all of the highest achievements and all of the worst characteristics of humanity's greatest villains. And notice in verse 7, twice it is said, this was given to him. That's such an important phrase. The the immediate giver of this gift to the Antichrist, of course, is Satan in this context. But the ultimate giver 
is none other than our sovereign God. These verbs indicate that the Antichrist is not doing this of his own accord as if he were in charge of history. History is God's story and Jesus is sovereign even in the darkest hours of human history. Just as Jesus was sovereign at another dark hour in history. I want to take you back to Jesus' first coming. In the words of Luke 22, we hear this. Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come against him. Now here is Jesus surrounded by leaders, authorities, and soldiers. And he says, have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of darkness are yours. Jesus, with all the authority of the universe, is saying that that hour leading up to his crucifixion and including his betrayal and murder belonged to the darkness. Because Jesus himself is sovereign over it. Jesus didn't go to the cross as a victim of the darkness. Jesus went to the cross intentionally to rescue people from the darkness. He granted them their hour so that you and I could be free. So that you and I could be alive. So that you and I could be forgiven. Extracted from our conformity to that darkness, enslavement to that darkness, participation in that darkness, Jesus endured it so that we could live. It wasn't Judas that was in charge. It wasn't the Pharisees that was in charge. It wasn't Pilate that was in charge or the Roman cohort that was in charge. Jesus the King was in charge even as he suffered as a servant on a cross. And in those moments, Satan had a temporary victory. In the words of the promise in Genesis 3.15, he crushed Messiah's heel. That is, he inflicted a serious wound. But in the great tribulation, in, in that hour of darkness, the satanic darkness will not encompass one garden or one garrison of Roman soldiers or one judgment seat or one hill, or one cross. No, the whole world will be enveloped. And the whole world will participate. This darkness will overwhelm. And the saints will be overpowered, outnumbered, and crushed under the world's coerced conformity to that darkness. And listen, make no mistake, our world is preparing for this hour. Even in our day today, and, and think about how dark this is, the killing of innocents and the most vulnerable among us is not only legal, protected, but even celebrated. Listen, it is not a far stretch for governments and populations to begin to eliminate every inconvenient human. In addition to total political victory in verse 7, we see in verse 8 a second crowning triumph of the Antichrist. And that is nearly total allegiance. Nearly total allegiance. Look at verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. All the earth dwellers will worship the Antichrist. Earth dwellers in the book of Revelation is a term that the book uses to describe a world of unbelief. They will uniformly give their religious allegiance to the beast. It will not merely be political machinery. This will touch the hearts of humans at the way they are built to worship. You might wonder, how could humanity surrender their rights, their tribes, lay down their arms and their creeds for this leader? Have you ever thought about that? How will an antichrist convince a, convince a bunch of Texans 
to give up their guns? How will the Antichrist convince the Arab world to let Jews rebuild a temple in Jerusalem on the Dome of the Rock? How will the world with all of its tribes, with all of its worldviews and all of its competing philosophies be convinced that getting one mind together around one guy with one creed is a good idea? It's kind of hard to imagine. We are so fractured in our humanity. But the text tells us that all the earth dwellers will indeed worship him. They will see him as wonderful and unbeatable. We read that last week. He is a man, but he is a man like no other before him. And perhaps his rise to power will resemble that of tyrants and emperors that have come already. But when he returns from the abyss of death as a supernaturally supercharged wonder worker, the world will fall before him. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 to 11. That lawless one will be revealed, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. It will be a deception. He will be an imitation of what the world might long for and hope for. The beast will be lovely and wonderful and powerful, fascinating, promising peace and unity. He will embody humanity's hope for escape from everything they've been experiencing. And and what will humanity have been experiencing up to this point in future history? The wrath of God coming down from heaven. A series of cataclysms that destroy the earth and and wipe out swaths of humanity. They, They will look for relief. And we have already read in the book of Revelation, they will not look to God for mercy via repentance. They will look for some solution against God, apart from God. And they will find it in the beast. It is a an insanity. But it's an insanity that we have seen before. If you've ever watched recordings of Nazi rallies in the 1930s, you have seen a crowd entranced by a leader. And I don't understand German. But it is stunning to watch a crowd's response to an evil leader. We see in our own day uh, the, the pomp and circumstance around celebrities. People just falling at the feet of famous people. We watch the, the pomp and circumstance of the professions of, uh, or processions of British royalty. Uh, the fascination with, with those of a higher class or, or maybe a, a, a noble birth. We can be reminded of that tower in the, of Babel. The unifying purpose of that tower was to get all of humanity together so that humanity could make a name for itself. Listen, our our philosophies are geared for a remake of the Tower of Babel. For the opportunity to worship anyone other than God. And humanity's religious impulse and humanity's penchant for self-aggrandizement will meet in the beast This will be the last installment of human government. This will be the last installment of human religion. And everyone will go in for it. How will this happen? How will the world be so duped? Well, there are a number of factors in this. First of all, the human heart. We were built to worship. And naturally, we worship anything other than God. The human heart is just prone to this kind of thing. Combine that with the ambition of a world ruler. Add to that the hangers-on, the entourage of those who will make themselves his allies for their own benefit. And then add to that the peer pressure of the crowd. The crowd being the entire inhabited earth. When everybody believes something whether it's the emperor's new clothes 
or evolution or the beast is the guy. When everybody believes it, it is hard to stand against. The whole world will feel that pressure. All the media will be in league. All the, all the opinions of the common folk, the little people and the mighty will all agree. Add to all of that, the working of Satan. He is behind the scenes, empowering signs and wonders that will be convincing. And then add to all of that, God's judgment on the earth dwellers. Listen to second Thessalonians 10. They didn't receive the love of the truth. So as to be saved for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. How will the whole world fall for this? A lot of responsible parties, including God's judgment, giving the world what the world has asked for. I want a world and everything I want in the world, but without God, thank you very much. Will this one world religion be sincere or will it be phony? I would suggest to you probably both. I I think there will be believers who sincerely believe this guy is the answer. The world will be amazed by the beast. But as we will see, Lord willing, next week, mandatory worship of the beast will be strictly enforced. And in one sense, it doesn't matter if the worshipers are sincere. Religion by the sword, religion by external conformity. That is Satan's game. He's okay with that. That, of course, is not God's way. God looks on the heart. Many who have an external conformity to Christianity will find out that never having been born again, they will be turned away in heaven. Depart from me, I never knew you. And they may protest, Lord, but I did this and this and this in your name. Mere external trappings of Christianity don't save. But a merely external conformity to beast religion will let you eat lunch. Will let you survive. The pressure will be too much. No one will be able to resist the total supremacy of Antichrist religion, except, as we see in verse 8, the elect. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 24 24 False Christs and false prophets will arise, they will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. In other words, it's not possible to steal the hearts of the elect, of those who truly belong to Christ. But the deceptions will be so strong that unless they were elect, they would be deceived. Notice how this is stated in Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. Everyone worships the beast except the elect. And notice how they're described. Their names are written in the book of life. That is, these are individuals selected in love by God to escape the fate that they deserve. They were part of fallen humanity. They were born in rebellion against God. They were rejectors and suppressors of truth. But they've been redeemed by the slain lamb. They've been secured by God's eternal purposes. The idea of a book of life shows up both in the Old Testament and the New Testament to describe God's record of his people whom he is saving and will save out of this world. It is a pre-written book. According to this verse, it is a book written from before the foundation of the world. This same idea shows up in chapter 17, 8, describing specifically the book that is written before the foundation of the world. Some of our English texts tell us that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. That is a grammatical possibility. But I think this text, like chapter 17, verse 8, should probably put the before the foundation of the world attached to the writing of the book. 
This book is not found in any library under the sun. God's registry transcends the troubles of this world. It is an emblem of his unalterable purpose to set his love on individuals for rescue unto eternal life. Daniel talked about this book, Daniel 12.1. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Talking about the great tribulation. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Notice here in Revelation 13, the names are written from the foundation of the world. This is a phrase that in scripture indicates the beginning of time, the beginning of creation. That is, an eternity is secure before any of us were ever born. And in this context, it is a guarantee that they will, in fact, not worship the Antichrist. We'll get to the mark of the beast next week. But spoiler alert, if you're afraid that somehow, mysteriously, you've already taken it and didn't know, you haven't. (laughs) We'll dig that out a little bit more fully next week. It's not on your Visa card. It's not in your computer. Hasn't happened yet. And the guarantee that those who believe in Christ, those who are by definition overcomers, have already had their names written in the Lamb's book of life. It is a guarantee that they will not worship the beast. The book holds their names, and they belong to the Lamb who was slain. Listen, sovereign election and the blood of Christ are enough to secure God's people even in the darkest and hardest trials. Jesus himself said in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And so the tribulation saints will be safely in the hands of their shepherd, even through martyrdom. In addition to total political victory and nearly total religious allegiance, the Antichrist will secure a third crowning triumph. We see it in verses 9 and 10. A thorough suppression of truth. In verse 9, we read, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Verse 9 introduces this thorough suppression of truth with a familiar refrain. It's a way to ask the question, are you on God's frequency? There's a, a radio band, a frequency God is broadcasting on. And if, if you've got a radio and you've got it tuned in to the right frequency, you're, you're hearing what God is saying. And if you don't have a radio or it's broken, or if you're tuned into the wrong frequency, you're not going to hear it. This is a, a way to describe the work of the Holy Spirit tuning the heart to hear God's truth, to believe God's truth. To resonate with God's truth. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, because those things are spiritually appraised. You have to have the Spirit of God to understand the things of the Spirit of God. Do you have your ears on? Are you on God's frequency? He who has ears, let him hear Jesus used this refrain in his teaching during his earthly ministry. And interestingly, it shows up in Matthew 11 and in Matthew 13. In Matthew 11, Jesus was speaking publicly truths clearly. And after chapter 11 comes Matthew chapter 12, where the religious leadership accused Jesus of doing miracles by the power of Satan. And from that point on, in the gospel of Matthew, Jesus only spoke publicly in parables. And he would take the disciples aside and speak to them privately and explain the parables. They asked him, why are you speaking in parables? And Jesus says, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom. In other words, spiritual ears to hear are a gift from God. Naturally, you don't have them. And turning away from clear public proclamation of truth 
to speaking publicly in parables by Jesus in his earthly ministry was a judgment against those who had rejected truth when they heard it. And we're here when you have the invitation, he who has ears, let him hear. This is a a gracious invitation for anyone listening to take heed. But only those who hear will do so. We saw this refrain in the letters to the seven churches. There it was said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And notice in Revelation 13, during the tribulation, the church is not mentioned. The true church has departed. And during the great tribulation, there will be no regular assemblies of followers of Christ. They will be on the run. They will be scattered under worldwide persecution. And this refrain in verse 9 points us forward. If you have ears to hear, hear this. Hear verse 10. And here's the content of verse 10. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he is to be killed. The appeal here is to respond with faith to what happens in verse 10. It's an encouragement. Don't give in. Hold fast. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. If captivity, captivity. If death by sword, death by sword. And if you're looking at at an English Bible, depending on which Bible you're looking at, this is going to read a couple of different ways. The King James, the New American Standard, the, the Legacy Standard Bible, they read this way. If anyone kills with the sword, he is to be killed by the sword. And the idea would be some sort of retribution, some sort of payback. Uh, And and it's been taken several different ways. If you try to fight the Antichrist, if if you try to take up arms against Antichrist government, you're going to get killed. Others have taken it. If the Antichrist kills the saints with the sword, he must be killed with the sword. The, The problem with that is he enters the lake of fire alive. We'll get to that in a few moments. But the ESV, the NIV, the HCSB, and a bunch of other letters describing English Bibles have it, I think, correctly. If you are to be killed, you are to be killed. And literally, both verbs in the Greek text are passives, and and they're exactly the same verb. And the idea is, God has sovereignly appointed destiny. If you are to be imprisoned, you're to be imprisoned. If you are to be martyred, then you are to be martyred. In fact, the wording of this proverbial statement comes from Jeremiah. Listen to Jeremiah 15, 2. Thus says the Lord, those destined for death to death, those destined for the sword to sword, those destined to famine to famine, those destined to captivity to captivity. And Jeremiah 43, 11, he will come and strike the land. Those who are meant for death will be given to death. Those for captivity to captivity, those for the sword to the sword. John's picking up the same language, and he's describing the sovereignty of God over the sufferings of the saints. In Revelation 13, the tribulation saints. It's a proverbial way of telling the great tribulation saints that the Antichrist will exact the most thorough program of truth suppression the world has ever known. Total political and military victory, nearly total religious allegiance And stamping out protests, stamping out the truth, stamping out any other ideas. We know this from the mob in the 20th century. The the mob, the mafia would kill witnesses so that they couldn't testify in court. And maybe more recently in the news, political enemies sometimes die inexplicably, inexplicably in prisons so that they don't squeal. Media platforms today have vast powers of censorship and manipulation, and they can, through algorithmic predetermination, decide what humanity needs to see and hear. Bury the truth. Under the reign of Antichrist, the censorship will be lethal. This is a messaging monopoly. No alternative media, no witnesses to the truth. If you find a witness to the truth, they are to be imprisoned or killed. This is a total blackout conspiracy of darkness. And truth suppression is what humans do naturally. 
Turn to Romans chapter 1. Heaven's indictment of humanity in Romans 1.18 is this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. God has given to every human being a recognition of truth, internally and externally. Every human being has been programmed by God to know that God exists. And every human being internally has a conscience, a capacity for the understanding of categories of right and wrong. And every human being has been furnished by the external testimony of the created universe, which screams out the glory of God, Psalm 19, and declares God's invisible eternal attributes, Romans 1. And what do men do with this revelation from God, internally and externally? Paul says they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Taking all of that testimony about God and trying to stuff it in a box and sit on the lid and say, there is no God, there is no God, there is no morality, do whatever you want. Obscure the truth, bury the truth, hide the truth, suppress the truth. When Jesus was on the earth, he made the same indictment, John 3, 19, Light came into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Can't let the light out. It's going to expose the dark corners. I like my dark corners. Hide the light. Suppress the truth. This is what has been natural to humanity ever since the fall. It is individualized censorship of the testimony of truth at the heart level. We got to silence the witness, snuff out the witness. I want to get on with my rebellion. I can't be bothered with these truth testimonies inside me and in nature. In the last days, this truth suppression will be official public policy all over the world. It will be made law and it will be enforced by imprisonment and death. What will the saints need? In such times, look at the end of verse 10. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. They need enduring faith, faithful endurance. Endurance is to remain under affliction and combined with faith here is to do so with unwavering confidence in God. In these desperately difficult times, it will mean holding fast to God at the cost of one's life. They will have to trust him, as did Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. In 155 AD, he was martyred in Smyrna, burned to death. He was given the opportunity to recant and to escape. And he said this, Eighty and six years have I served Christ. He never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And he gladly endured being burned as a martyr. The perseverance and faith of the saints going to prison, perhaps being killed, is a readiness to suffer and to die without retaliation. There's no fighting for rights. You have to understand that under Antichrist's total political victory, there will be no Bill of Rights. There will be no courts of appeals, no recourse to justice. He will be unaccountable to any human courts. This is the time of his total victory. That will leave only three options for followers of Jesus during that time. Run and hide, imprisonment, or death. 
This will require enduring faith. Well, so the temptation to cave in will be real. I got to feed my family. I can't even buy groceries without taking the mark of the beast. It will seem safe to cave in. Have you thought about that word safe? We, we prize it. Sometimes we can make an idol out of safety. There is a real safety to be had, to strive for. It is safety in Christ. You do know that you are safe in your obediences to God. You can be in a really hard situation where the safety of your job is at stake. But you have to know, Christian, that your true safety is in faithfulness to Christ and not making compromises. You might be in a difficult marriage and think that your best hope is to get out. That your safety is in some other situation. Your safety is always in Christ. You may be in a difficult situation under government persecution or hostile enemies of the gospel. Your true safety is in Christ. Fidelity to Jesus will probably not make your life in this dark world easier. But refuge in him is true safety. God's plan for your life now, as God's plan for tribulation saints will be, is not a life of ease, comfort, and physical safety. We who follow Christ must learn to expect suffering. And we have to prepare our hearts to endure suffering through faith. And faith hits the fast forward button on history. Faith helps us skip to the end of the story. To remind ourselves that in Jesus you are on the side of true victory. If you belong to the Lamb who overcomes, then you yourself are the overcomer. The world might be overcome by darkness, but only for a time. Fast forward the story. You see, the great imitator will imitate Jesus. He will have his worldwide kingdom. He will have a united humanity and one religion. I'm reminded of Pharaoh's magicians. When Moses was in there working miracles by the power of God and, and Pharaoh's magicians by their dark arts were imitating some of those miracles. They couldn't do all of them, but they did some enough to amaze Pharaoh and enough for his heart to be hardened against God. They said, oh yeah, we can do that. The great imitator will imitate the things that Jesus will do. Satan imitates the Trinity with the unholy Trinity. The beast imitates Jesus. The false prophet will imitate the signs and wonders. The Antichrist even imitates a death and a resurrection. But I have to tell you, I have a favorite imitation. If I'm allowed to have a favorite imitation of the great imitator. I think he imitates the rapture. Unintentionally. Look at Revelation 19. The beast and the false prophet both will experience a deathless entrance into eternity. Look at Revelation 19. As the armies of the beast assemble to fight Jesus, it all ends very quickly and anticlimactically. Verse 20, the beast is seized and with him, the false prophet who did the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And you have to understand they become the only two occupants of the lake of fire for a thousand years. It is not till the end of the millennial kingdom, according to Revelation 20, that the dead are raised from Hades, brought before the great white throne of Jesus, and assessed, and all those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life are thrown into the lake of fire. It is not till then that Satan gets out of his thousand-year prison, and he himself is thrown into the lake of fire. And it's not until then that death and Hades, personified, are thrown into the lake of fire. For a thousand years, the only two occupants in the lake of fire are the beast and the false prophet 
thrown alive. It's all over very quickly. The three and a half years, no doubt, will feel like an eternity to the earth dwellers. But it ends with a quick drop and an eternal stop into the lake of fire alive. Let's contemplate some takeaways for a moment for us. Lord willing, you will not be present for these events. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you will not be present for these events. And and yet there are things for us to learn. And I would say, first of all, that ecumenism sounds nice. Ecumenism is is the idea religiously of, of sort of Rodney King approach to philosophies. We all just want to get along. I mean, why is it so hard for the, the, the tribalism of, of the world to go? Why, why is it so hard for, for different religions not to just see eye to eye? Can't, can't we make some compromises? Can't we meet in the middle? Can't, can't we drop those things that separate us and, and just get together? There are plenty of organizations that, that seek to do this very thing. If you've ever studied the Baha'i religious movement or if you've ever been to a Baha'i temple, it is unapologetically every religion and every religious leader all in one building and we pay homage to everything means nothing. It all gets flattened out so there are no convictions, no creeds, no beliefs and that's the conviction, creed and belief. Listen, the world is gravitating to these things more and more. It it wasn't very long ago in world history that that everybody kind of had their religion and they fought everybody else, but there is an increasing desire to join them all together. In fact, if you follow Roman Catholic theology, it is extremely integrationist. That is, is, it is willing to be sort of voodoo superstitious in the Caribbean. It is willing to be Islamic in the Middle East. It is willing to be anything, anywhere, as long as you're part of Mother Church. And I think this is confusing for us in our day because Roman Catholicism, though by doctrines and creeds, is opposed by anathemas to the doctrines of justification by faith alone and other evangelical doctrines. Roman Catholicism in America has taken on a very evangelical flavor. And that just hints at the whole idea that this, this thing that sounds so nice that we would drop our convictions and just get along together with spiritual truth we can all agree on is very attractive to a fallen world. And my encouragement to us is don't fall for world religion talk in our day. You may have heard spiritual truth compared to like a wagon wheel with spokes and a hub. The different religions of the world are all spokes on the same wheel and they all end up in the same place. There are many ways to God. It's basically all the same message and it boils down to sort of try a little bit to be a good person or just don't judge or you just got to have faith, but don't say anything about what that faith is in. I believe Satan in our day is test driving the lie that will consume the world in the last days. And the last few generations of the church, the the evangelical church, have have begun to fall for it. The the dropping of biblical convictions as if the Bible isn't allowed to speak strongly about what the Bible says is a remarkable trend in 20th century Christianity. And listen, the lie is convincing because it apes the truth. And it it is a dark and sinister mimic. It's an evil impersonation of the truth. Listen, world peace is coming. A united humanity is coming. One world worship is coming. It's all coming under the true Christ. But as a last gasp, the world will try to have it without Jesus. And it will be awful. The adherents of a Jesusless empire will realize only too late that they cashed in everything for a deadly deception. And so here's a second takeaway. If you're here this morning and you are trying to live life now without Jesus, you know, you you want the benefits of a life that only Jesus can give, but, but you want it without him. Let me suggest to you that you have already fallen for the lethal lie that will consume the world. 
And now you are hearing God's word. There is a means of escape for you. Listen to Jesus' words in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Those are all exclusive statements. There's, there aren't other ways, other truths, and other lives. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. That is an exclusive invitation. Do you understand? There's only one way to heaven, but the one who is that way is saying, come to me and have it. He says in John 3, 36, the one who believes in the son possesses eternal life, but the one who does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Listen, the believer in Jesus Christ is the true overcomer who overcomes the darkness that will overcome the world. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we, that is any believer in Jesus Christ, overwhelmingly conquer, we literally super conquer, through him who loved us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you overcame. And because you overcame, all who believe in you overcome. We know this world will be overwhelmed, conquered by the darkness that is coming. When the Antichrist is present on the earth, the world will rally around him instead of you. And even now, the spirit of Antichrist is present and active. We pray that we would not be deceived, but we would hold fast to truth. Lord, if it would cost us imprisonment or death or any other kind of hardship, we pray that we would have enduring faith to embrace it and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. For you who overcame all these things, cause us to share in your victory. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.